was five years old, I had no idea I'd ever be on the stage in the spotlights in front of almost a hundred people here following up on someone like Diana from McKinsey. When I was five years old, what I wanted most was the playground go-karts. And each break time, I would run out as fast as my little legs could carry me and wait patiently in front of the ship. Would the teacher pick me today? Was it my turn? But it never was. It never was my turn. And I started looking who did get the go-karts. And you know what I found out? It was the big ones up front who always got the go-karts, the loud ones, the loud boys up front always got them. So I changed tack. Next break, I was the first one out and I would run as fast as I could and I would push my way through and say, me, pick me, I want the go-karts. And guess what? It worked. <laughs> But it didn't really work. Because it somehow, it took a lot of energy. I was black and blue in front of the process. And that girl, that pushy, loud girl, somehow didn't really feel like me. So I never did it again. I decided maybe the go-karts were just not for me. And I believe that's what's happening to women in our organizations. They enter into organizations with beautiful degrees and qualifications, put their heads down, and diligently start working. Until that moment, when they start realizing it's not them that are getting the promotions. It's the loud boys. The loud boys are getting the promotions time and again. And that's when they change tack. They do leadership programs, they come to conferences like this, they learn to build their confidence, how to gain gravitas, how to broadcast their achievements, and how to build their profile. And it works for some. We all know women who that has worked for, and I know there are some of those in here right now. But it doesn't work for many. <coughs> Anecdotally, I can tell you that HR managers in the UK tell me that 30 to 50% of their female workforce leave between the age of 30 and 40. See, I think what we are doing in our organizations is asking women to be successful in organizations that are designed for man, ecosystems that are designed for man. And that's like asking a fish to climb a tree. To many women, it feels like they have to grow arms to hold on. <coughs> and there's some really interesting research that Barbara Ennis did in the United States, and she's a gender intelligence researcher. And she went to interview 2,000 women in senior management positions um, who had left organizations. She went to Asia, Europe, and the US, and this is what she found. This is why women leave organizations. The obvious reason that women mentioned work-life balance issues. And indeed, 30% of the women she interviewed did mention that as one of the reasons they left. But women leave for many other reasons too. Over 50% of women leave because they're looking up and they don't see any opportunities for them. They're looking up and they see a male-dominated culture that somehow doesn't feel right for them. And over 60% of women, women leave because they feel excluded and undervalued. What these women are saying in those interviews, and these were all senior women who had left, is that they felt like a fish out of the water. And I'm just wondering here, and I know it's the end of the day, so I need a bit of your cooperation here. But what do you see in your organizations? Does, does these, do these stories resonate? Do you see women have to change when they come into organizations? Mm -hmm. Do you feel you have to change? What, what was it like for you? Have you grown arms? Are you enjoying that? So can I just see a show of hands if those people do recognize those stories? Oh, you've got to wake up. Yeah. Do you recognize this? Anyone there recognize this? Yes. Okay. So simple, right? 
organizations aren't designed for, man, for women. <coughs> but what then do we do? Well, the answer is also very simple. We just need to change our organizations so they work for women. We need to change our mindset. Just like Mackenzie was saying, there's a mindset change required. And what I would like to argue is we need to change from changing the women to changing organizations. But what does that mean? What do women need? What do women need that is different from what men need? Well, I was asked that question, so I had to look into it. I looked into gender differences, neuroscience, psychology. <coughs> what do we know from biology? What do we know from hormones? And how does that impact our behavior? And I came up, I summarized that in six gender differences, which I write about in my book. Now, none of these six are very scientific. It's very much a sort of quick summary. If you don't want to go through all the literature I went through, of what these differences are that impact our behavior at work. And I'd like to go into one, just to give you a flavor of what the impact is when I start talking about this. However, before I go into it, you need to know that I don't believe in boxing people in. I know a lot of people here don't believe in saying, oh, women are like this. I don't want to say, women are like this, and men think like that. It's not like that. You and you and you, you're all individuals. And actually, none of the research says women are like this. It says, it talk, the research talks about preferences that you're born with or that grow over time. But interestingly enough, when I start boxing it in and start talking about these black and white differences, something happens. It helps women, it helps leaders, and it helps organizations. And this is how it helps. And that actually surprised me a bit too, because I thought it was a bit black and white. So let me go into one and show you. So men and women compete differently. Now just a quick flavor of what that means. Men tend to compete on being the strongest, the fastest, the guy with the best status, the, the guy who earns most, who's best at computer programming, who's best at playing computer games. Women compete too. And they compete very fiercely. They're not always known for that. But women compete on something else. Women compete on being nice, relationships, being popular. Now, when I say this to women, they just look at me like, women aren't nice. You know, this doesn't necessarily, in order to be seen as the nicest woman, you need to be quite vicious and sometimes manipulative. <laughs> it's the sort of thing you see at birthday parties. Are we still friends? Can I come to your birthday party? Well, she's been nice to me, so she can come to my birthday party next week. That's girls building hierarchies. Now, what does that mean at work? It means that women trying to be nice, trying to be popular, do things like this. They say, um, I have this idea. What do you, but I'll, I'll just mention it to you and then I'd love to hear your opinion. What do you guys think? It is brilliant because it's drawing in the expertise of everyone. That sort of behavior is creating engagement, it's creating an inclusive team, and it means that once you start implementing, things go a lot faster. And when I tell that to women, they come up to me afterwards, and they say, you know, Inga, that's really interesting, because you know, I thought I was a bit silly, really, and I work in a bank, and I thought I need to be really more professional. Now I realize it's actually fine. This is my way of working. And I achieve results in my own way. And recently I was doing this in Royal Bank of Scotland and a senior woman came up to me and she said, I wish I'd known this 15 years ago. Because you know, Inga, the feedback I was getting was you're too emotional. And I would always put my head down and think, oh yeah, I'm a bit of a failure, you know, I'm just too emotional, really. But actually, after 15 years of working with clients, Inga, I realize that that's the way why clients keep on returning to me. That's how I build client relationships. So recently, someone came up to me and said, Carla, you're just way too emotional. You know what I said to them? I said to them, yes, and that's why I have such a strong client base. See what's happening there. Women are certainly starting to do what we want them to do. 
they start to speak up about their achievements in a very confident way because they suddenly know where it comes from. They suddenly know, okay, I compete differently and there is a good thing to that because I create this inclusive behavior. Obviously not all women do that. I have to just, it's like the sort of the black and white bit here. You have to bear with me. Right? So I ask women, do you recognize this? Which of these differences do you have? And which are the ones that you bring value with? And you may want to think about that too. Is this something that you do? Do you know if, how this is in affecting your strength and your value at work? Now I also talk about this to leaders, managers, team managers. And then I explain to them that, um, that women compete differently and that it means it's harder for women to put themselves forward. Because saying, hey, I think I need a pay rise, that's not very nice. People might not like you if you do that. And then actually, um, someone uh, in the NHS recently came up to me. He says, look, I'm head of a lab. And I've just realized that some of the women in my team are absolutely ready for promotion. But I just never hear from them. They, they seem to be happy the way they are. But I've just realized that I need to go and ask them. Because I've realized that they might find it awkward to, to put this forward to me. See what this manager's doing? He's doing exactly what we want managers to do, to understand what the issues of women are, and then to change his behavior to make sure that it, his management style works for men as women. And just you may want to ask yourself, am I one of these people who's promoting the loud voice? Or am I actually drawing in and asking women as well? Oh, one more, sorry, we need one more here on number three. I do the same with organizations and you see the same thing happening. As soon as we know that men and women compete differently, we can create systems that, for instance, are not about career ladders, but are about um, br broader careers, career lattices is what they're called. We can create transparent and fair systems where women know what the criteria are. Um, and once they know, it gives them a framework of, oh, I'm allowed to step up because I'm fitting the criteria. So it's just little nudges here that make it then really easy for women to put themselves forward without having to feel they compete. Now I was doing these stories and what happened um, was that people were asking me more and more about it and it took me a bit by surprise. And I felt it needed more, it needed a book. And a book is there now in the bookshop, published this October. So I'm still, it's a bit new still for me. And I send out um, the book to some of the most senior women I know, who almost all of them gave very, gave very positive responses. And the one that stuck most with me was the one from Helena Morrissey, who you may know or not, is a CEO of a large investment fund in the UK. She's also the founder of the 30% Club. And she has nine children. And she wow. said, <laughs> that's how we all know her in the UK. <laughs> And she said, this really resonates with me because I don't want my daughters to go through what I have done. I don't want them to compromise the way I've had to compromise to get that voice at the table. In fact, she's saying, I don't want my daughters to grow arms. And you know what? That's no longer necessary because we've heard today over 50% of our workforce is female, over 50% of our graduates is female. It's time for a change. It is time we stop changing the women and start changing the world around them. It's time we change our mindset and create a world at work that works for men as well as women. We need to create a place where women can feel they are respected and valued for who they are and what they bring. What we need to do is create small rivers and ponds and streams a place where women can feel they can swim freely. What we need to do is create lakes and oceans where both men and women can contribute from their strengths. So what does that mean for you? What can you take away from this? How can you help create those ponds? Got three takeaways for you. One. Start creating gender-smart women. 
women that feel confident in what they bring, whether that is emotional or whether that is maybe seen as silly initially. So they can feel authentic because they know they are valued for swimming. Start creating gender smart leaders. Team managers, male and female, who understand how men and women work, what men and women need. So we create places that feel in, where women can feel inclusive and valued, where women can feel they can swim freely and not have to grow arms. And we need to create gender smart organizations, places where the processes and systems are in place that work for everyone, transparent and fair systems that work for men as well as women. Because you know what? Remember that five-year-old girl and her go-kart trade. Just imagine if that teacher would have understood that waiting patiently meant that she was just as keen and ambitious to get the go-karts as those loud boys in front. Surely that teacher would have been able to come up with a system that worked for both boys and girls. And you know what, I can tell you that that little girl would have in that case gone for the go-karts time and again. And she would have never decided to give up 